I'm here at the University of Southern California where experts along with colleagues at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles have been working on congenital muscular torticollis. They have conducted a new analysis which informs the guidelines and helps clinicians to get the very best outcomes for children. In 2013 and 2018, clinical practice guidelines were published on congenital muscular torticollis and standards of practice are that these clinical practice guidelines are updated every five years. So that's why there was one in 2013 and a follow-up in 2018. And so the 2018 CMT CPG is due for an update in 2023. What we did was we com completed a systematic review. We essentially searched the databases to ultimately update the CPG that was completed in 2018 on congenital muscular torticollis. Um, and we set out looking for research articles on the assessment tools, interventions, and prognosis. Our goal was really just to see, is there any new evidence emerging? And do the guidelines need to be shifted or changes, changed? Is what we're doing still appropriate, still working? Or do we need to add or change things? Before the congenital muscular torticollis clinical practice guidelines, everyone was treating the children differently. Um, and so it was, and we didn't know that starting earlier was better. So a lot of physicians were doing this wait and see approach where they may even show the parents a little bit of stretching, um, but they would wait to refer the children to physical therapy until six, seven, eight months of age. And now we know that's far too late and that if we can get involved earlier before three months or even earlier than that at one month, that we do a very short duration of physical therapy and we get beautiful outcomes from that. The purpose of the systematic review was to look at the literature that has been published from January of 2017 to June of 2022 and we looked through six databases and we collected all of the data that was published during that time frame and were able to pool specific articles that were applicable to the topic of CMT for physical therapists and so we were hoping to then appraise that literature and make any recommendations for the update to the 2018 CMT CPG. So in 2013, the big thing was that um, we needed to provide intervention early um, and that our intervention was effective if it was provided under the age of one. In 2018, what we kind of added to that was the fact that these guidelines actually worked to improve clinical care. Um, so the children were being identified earlier, um, they were being provided the right interventions, the first choice interventions, um, and they, we were getting some nice outcomes from that. And now in um, 2023, we're looking to further inform the clinical practice guidelines with more kind of specific evidence about what we've been doing so far. For assessment tools, we found that typical tools like goniometer, arthrodial protractor, um, were, we found reliability data on those specific tools. There were also two new tools that were being utilized in this population, the therapy behavior scale and the functional symmetry observation scale. Those two scales are still relatively new, and so there isn't that much data on them at this time. For interventions, we were able to find additional data on passive stretching, as well as traditional Chinese medicine and neural and visceral manipulation. And then the big take home kind of from that section is that passive stretching is still a very, very effective tool when working with this patient population. Um, it's actually found to be better than active range of motion or active assisted range of motion or thermal heat. Um, for prognosis, we found that CMT severity plays a very large role in the treatment duration, the number of units that are billed, the episode of care duration. And so we found that as severity increases, specifically for CMT severity grades one through three, the number of units billed increases, the total duration of care increases, and um, as well as the treatment duration, the number of visits. We found in our study, because um, passive range of motion has been a part of the first choice intervention since the clinical practice guideline, but um, specifically in our systematic review, we found a study that highlighted that that was actually more effective than active range of motion and thermal therapy. So passive range of motion is essentially stretching that infant into kind of the opposite movement that they are positioned in. So for example, if I had left torticollis, I would be positioned like this. The therapist's goal would be to kind of stretch into that opposite position. And it's a passive thing that the therapist tries to complete while the infant stays calm and relaxed. Mm. And how 
often do you have to give this therapy and for how long? Yeah, so actually it is known that the more the passive stretch is completed, the better. I think there was a study done in the 2018 systematic review done by Emily um, that found the more intensive the stretching, the more frequent, the better the outcome. Does this mean that you need to involve caregivers and parents? Oh my goodness, yes. The caregiver is actually the biggest part. Um, we actually also had a study in our systematic review that looked at kind of the caregiver's perspective when having an infant diagnosed with CMT and the importance of kind of tailoring that home exercise program to what is feasible for them and what they feel can be accomplished. Because like you said, um, what we do in therapy is not as important as what the caregiver can do at home. Kind of the take home message from the review is that the current recommendation for passive stretching in the 2018 CMT CPG is rated as moderate. So the strength of that recommendation is moderate. And with the data that we found that recommendation strength could change to strong. So basically emphasizing the importance of passive stretching and really utilizing that as a tool when treating these infants. Mm. So what would you recommend physical therapists to be doing all around the world? To really continue with passive stretching. If you're not utilizing passive stretching to really incorporate that into your practice, most physical therapists do use passive stretching as a tool when working with infants with CMT. And so we really want to emphasize utilizing that as a very strong point. Whether that's you performing the passive stretching during a therapy session or instructing the parents to perform that passive stretching at home with their infant. So the new areas going forward were before we knew kind of what the different assessments were, but now we have more information about their psychometric properties um, and so how reliable they are, how valid they are. There's also a couple new measures that are coming out, so we were able to highlight those couple new measures. In terms of interventions, what we found was that we had one study that showed that stretching as compared to active assist movement, as compared to thermotherapy, was actually more um, beneficial for improving cervical range of motion. Um, and so it provided stronger support for stretching. Um, we also got the parent perspective, which was really nice. Um, before, we didn't have that information. So now we know that we really need to support parents in implementing um, their home programs. Um, and then lastly, there are some supplemental interventions, the visceral neuromanipulation and traditional Chinese massage um, that we know are feasible. We don't know if they're efficacious yet, but we do know they're feasible to use with kids with congenital muscular torticollis. Right, so what recommendations would you send out to pediatric physical therapists around the world about how to manage an infant with congenital muscular torticollis? Um, so what I would say is start as early as you can. Um, evaluate them using the outcome measures that we know are most efficacious. So uh, measuring passive range of motion, measuring using the muscle function scale for active range of motion, providing the first choice interventions, um, and then um, and really doing a good job educating the parents on the home program and how to incorporate that home program into their daily routine.